Maybe y'all can get that sorted out and give me some information on how we're going to cure all the ills of our political system. All right, um, 951, the inflammatory response, and we're in part one of your notes trying to finish this up here. For anybody, the you three people at home that may uh, check this out, just to hope everything's going well. Um, and so we went through and we talked about some initial parts of the innate immune system. Um, and if you're making this concept map like I asked you to, which you're going to need, hopefully by Monday you'll have it sorted out. On the top part, I've got skin and the mucus, uh, mucus membranes. And then once, like I said, you need to think of this like a, um, a battlefield. So once an invader gets past like your skin and your mucous membranes, then it's gonna encounter a different level of defense. Um, it's gonna start infecting cells and then um, there are other responses that are gonna take place. And then we're gonna kind of get into, hopefully by the end of the day today, we'll get into some of these specific responses to the immune system, which is probably the most important in understanding how the cells communicate. Um, and also, you'll notice I've got a number of different little um, letters here for uh, different chemicals that are used in the signaling process. Bless you. So make sure you include those chemical signals. Yes, Katie? And one day, what is a flora? Flora means the stuff living on you. Okay. Your natural things that are living on you. Yeah, like I said the other day, um, that you have bacteria and fungi that are trying to occupy your um, body, trying to take over, colonize different areas of your body. Um, most of them are good and harmless, and oftentimes they do help to um, outcompete some of the harmful ones that we have to deal with. So that's a benefit. Anyway, so let's talk about the inflammatory response. Um, in your notes, oh, I lost my spot. In your notes, inflammatory response. This is what happens when the body is attacked or injured. Or you might just say, anytime it encounters a foreign invader. Um, because when you get like a splinter like you see on 951, there are going to be bacteria, viruses, whatever that's not supposed to be there that get inserted into your body whether you want them or not. Now, when you get some type of cut or scrape or infection, what what do you notice about that on your body? What are some things, characteristics? Red. It's red. They're swelling. Why is it red? Because it's like heating up. It's heating up? Is it on fire? No. Like... Why is it heating up? Because there's more black cells around it. So, let's go through here. Capillaries dilate or open. So, to be clear, in your body, some, some body basics here. Your circulatory system, your heart, carries blood away from your heart in arteries. arteries. The arteries divide up and get smaller, and they're called arterioles. And then they divide up smaller and smaller until they're like so small that just like one blood cell can fit through them. Those are called capillaries, capillaries that reach throughout the, all parts of your body to bring nutrients, oxygen, carry away CO2, that whole nine yards. You getting that, Matt? So, um, and then the blood has to flow back to the heart. So from the capillaries, um, blood flows into the, what brings blood back to the heart? Um. Veins. But before you get big veins that have blood flowing back to the heart, the capillaries kind of channel that blood back into venules, which are small veins basically. And then they come together and into the veins and then the blood back into the top right part of your heart here. Um, so that's how blood flows throughout your body. So when you have some type of a, a cut, scrape, infection, whatever, and it turns red, it's because part A under the notes there, capillaries dilate or open. So the capillaries get bigger, okay? They dilate. The venules, which is where the blood would flow out of the capillaries, they close they constrict it says closed i'm sure they're not completely closed up but they they close they get smaller so basically what you're doing is you've got an increased blood flow to that area hence is why it gets red and swollen you get a pimple 
it gets red and swollen. It's because there's an increased blood flow. That blood is trapped in that area. The purpose of that increased blood flow and trapping that blood in the area is to do what? To bring fighters to that area to attack whatever invaders have gotten in. And so basically it's an in, in, a way of increasing your, your troop force to one area, okay? Things that would result. Number one, Katie. Redness, swelling, or being feet and pain occur with an inflammatory response. Anytime we see an inflammatory response, good. Number two, five. Okay, what releases the histamines? Yeah. Mast cells, good. All right, let's transition over to your book really quick on 951. Walker, read number one. 951. Um, at the injury site, mast cells release histamines, which cause nearby capillaries to dilate. Macrophages release other signaling molecules that increase local blood flow. Okay, so capillaries dilate, blood flow is coming in. Um, mast cells release histamines causing that inflammation. Um, this happens a lot on, on something your body sees as a foreign invader. What do y'all take to counteract this? Antihistamines, Anti yummy. Benadryl, Allegra, Zyrtec, Claritin, blah, blah, blah. So, um, some of you have overactive response systems. Um, you know who you are, the 36 of you who have allergies on your medical report here. And you are allergic to a wide variety of things. It's unexplainable to me, but anyway. Um, so, a lot of that is just your body is responding to something it sees as a foreign invader. And it's like, um, hey, this thing's getting in. It's not supposed to be here. Let's fight it off. When in reality, it was a grain of pollen or, you know, a leaf of blade of grass. So anyway, um, and some of you are less susceptible to those, probably depending upon how much time you spent outside as a child, if I had to guess. Um, Y'all can look, look that up more in under hygiene hypothesis, which is an interesting uh, take on allergens. All right, chemokines. We're gonna look at different chemokines. These are some of the signal molecules that attract phagocytes or the white blood cells, the, the heavy eaters to that area. Um, and so we're going to start adding in and talking about those chemical signals, but that's one there. Well, that's a couple of them actually, histamines and chemokines. My body really wants to sneeze. Don't do it. Okay. So, um, number three, Miranda. When you get one of those teenage nuisances called a pimple, well, some people, we have them in, uh, elsewhere in life, but, you know, teenagers tend to have more problems with pimples, with um, hormones and all the stuff that's going on in your lives. Um, when you pop one of those pimples, what comes out of it? White stuff. No, well, maybe if it, you're thinking, I think, more blackheads. Most of the time when you have a white head and you have like a bunch of white stuff pops out of it, it's primarily neutrophils. Yes, delicious. All right, neutrophils follow the chemical trail to the site. Macrophages come in and help to clean it up. Now, um, you may pop a pimple when stuff comes out, or if you just left it alone, eventually your body's supposed to have these macrophages come in and eat and clean up stuff. But, you know, when you get like a Mac Daddy pimple, then uh, it may take a while. So a lot of times it, it relieves the pressure and irritation um, when you just pop that joker. Or maybe you just like watching it on TV. Who knows? All right, next thing, pyrogens. Fire proteins from white blood cells. That sounds dangerous. Matthew, you got the notes? Can you read that for us? Pyrogens? These proteins carry out a, system, a systemic entire body response by turning up the heat by increasing cellular respiration with the cells in your body, what we call a fever. You give me fever. You my Elvis fan. So, systemic means throughout the whole body. 
These proteins carry out a systemic response by heating it. Why would we want a fever? What is the purpose of fever? The, the, hold on a second. The, the actual pathogens don't cause the fever. The fever is something your body is doing. So next time you got a fever, you know, don't blame your pathogen. Blame, blame your body. Well, I mean, it's really the pathogen's fault. Let's be honest. Katie. Sir. What'd you say? Why do you want a fever? Hmm. That's how you get, like, super high temperatures when you're, like, super sick. You're on the right track. Nathan? Are you trying to, like, denature the pathogen? I don't know that you're getting hot enough to denature the protein. That's a good question. Like, uncomfortable. It, it, pathogens, typically pathogens that infect us and do well in us, typically they are going to replicate best at, like, our body temperature. Um, and so when you raise your body temperature significantly, Katie, I think what you were getting at is you are, you're slowing their replication and you're giving your immune system a chance to recover. Now, the problem is when, if you have kind of an overactive response, I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, Helen Keller, she had what, when she was about two years old, scarlet fever, and she had a temperature, it's thought to be in excess of 105 for a couple weeks. And so that's what caused the brain damage that made her deaf and blind. Um, and so most of the time now when people have really bad fevers, um, usually they'll take, you know, ibuprofen or Tylenol or whatever your doctor directs. Some people stack them depending on how bad the fever is. Um, most pediatricians now, I'm, since I'm on tape here, make sure you go by your pediatrician's directions when you're um, sick. But most pediatricians, at least mine with my kids, We'll say don't give them any fever reducer until their temperature is over um, 101.4. Maybe it's it's either 100.4 or 101.4, which is a pretty low grade fever um, because basically they're saying like let their body let their bodies naturally fight it um, unless it's getting too high. So that's something to consider. Now the exception that i know of would be uh cold viruses you know how you can't like catch a cold from being outside so like when you get when you get a cold that's a virus that's causing that so that's a virus that's making you sick is a cold virus there's a bunch of different rhinoviruses that cause it um but it's they did some study recently and they found out that in your nasal passages that that cold virus replicates better when it's colder, like when it's about 93 degrees. So if you're outside and it's cold and your nasal passages are colder, you're actually giving that virus a better chance of replicating. So you, that's the, why you increase that likelihood when it's colder outside. So that's something to think, think about. Um, Let's see here, pyrogens, that's cool. Um, interferons, here's another chemical signal. Um, I've got these on my little uh, map out to the side. So after a cell starts to get infected, Tay, read that for us. Uh, these are chemicals that you can use to Yeah, so the save your cell proteins, that'd be like Walker. If you got infected and so, you know, the body cells are pretty good about being altruistic or altruistic, however you want to say it, um, where, you know, even if Walker gets infected, he's not like, save me, blah, blah, blah. He's like, he's like, kill me, save yourself. Because most cells are sending out signals for the white blood cells to come in and kill them to prevent more virus spreading. And also, in this case, with the uh, interferons, um, these are signals other, signals other cells to around them to make antiviral substances. So that'd be the equivalent of Walker saying like, hey, Matt, hey, Mariah, um, this virus is attacking me, and you need to get your stuff sorted out to fight it off. Or if you know it was medieval times and Walker was like, the dragon attack, attacked my village, um, you might want to get your pitchfork and shovel ready. So... Good luck to you on that. Anyway, um, it is another one of those signal molecules that helps in the fight. Now, major histocompatibility complexes. 
We're gonna refer to these as MHCs because I can't say that, those three words too often. But before we go on, let's look at um, Naked Guy on 950 here. So this is a kind of overview of the lymphatic system. And the lymphatic system, so we talked about circulatory system. Y'all are familiar with blood going out in arteries and coming back in veins. That's pretty, you know, probably pretty well versed in that. The lymphatic system is a little bit different. So when blood gets out to all these capillaries on the outside extensions of your body, um, and they're transporting nutrients and stuff to the tissues around them, um, sometimes some of that fluid like leaks out of the capillaries. And you've got to have a way of like pulling all that fluid and circulating it and getting it back in. And so what happens is the lymphatic vessels help to bring and kind of move that fluid back in. It moves it through a series of stages here, um, different areas where the lymph nodes are. I told you about the time I thought I had breast cancer, didn't I? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you look there on his left side, so you see there's one large lymph node there under his left breast by his armpit. You'll see that there's just one over there on, the, on his left side of his body. When you, when you look at someone and you're talking about anatomical terms, you always think of it in their body's position. So you gotta think of them, you know, like where is his left side? So over there under his left uh, lung there, right at the bottom, that's the one that was like swollen up and it was hard. And I went to the doctor cause I was like, I hope I don't have breast cancer. Anyway, um, but you've got lymph nodes that can swell up all throughout your body. Inside the lymph nodes, you've got a lot of fighter cells. Y'all heard of lymphocytes? If not, you're going to here in a second, and I hope you read over part two, which you must not have if you don't know what lymphocytes are. But B cells and T cells are those lymphocytes that we'll get into. So anyway, and then y'all are all familiar with the lymph nodes up here in your neck that swell up sometimes when you get sick. They're probably the easiest ones to recognize. And you got a number just throughout your face and neck region. You got a bunch in your groin. Usually if you go to the pediatrician when you're little, they'll check and they'll push on you. They're looking for any kind of infection in those areas where there's a lot of lymph nodes. Okay, now let's move on to major histocompatibility complexes. On page 954. Here we go, let's go close, close enough. All right, so there's two different type of MHCs, MHC1 and MHC2. You need to know these because this is this is how cells in your body communicate directly with one another on fighting off specific pathogens. So if a virus comes into your body, infects, the cell, infects you, Walker, if you're one of the cells in the body, you're going to hold up a piece of that virus, outside of that virus, and you're gonna be like, and send out some signals and be like, hey guys, um, this is killing me and I'm gonna need you to come grab this and tell everybody else and fight this off so we all don't die. That's basically the immune system. Good, all right, so we can quit. Number one, well, these are membrane protein special hands, uh, special hands on regular cells and white blood cells. So if you look on 954 there at the top, you can see these um, MHCs here. Um, it's just the purple things that are sticking up. And on the end of them, they have an antigen binding site. Now, we need to talk about what an antigen is or that's not gonna make any sense. An antigen, actually, let's just go ahead and read part one here and it'll tell us. Read that for us, Mariah. All cells other than WBCs possesses these are for telling WBCs that a cell's infected when they are put out on the surface holding an antigen. Antibody generating particle in the hand. Keep going. Class two, all WBCs. No, no, no. Do you have a part A under that? Oh. The WBC knows to kill that cell because it is infected by the type of the gene. Okay. So, MHC1s are found on what type of cells? All cells besides WBCs. All cells except white blood cells. Good. Okay, so normal body cells. They have these little protein hands that if they get infected, they can hold up a piece of that pathogen, whatever's caused this infection, and they can hold it out for other, for the white blood cells to come and get, okay? So that they will know what to fight off. Now, the whole part of your um, concept map that I asked you to do right here, the whole top part 
is about non-specific immunity. When you start fighting off specific types of pathogens, then you're getting into the bottom part here where you're calling on different types of cells to fight off pathogens. And the basis for that, I think it's on 962 in your book, you can look, that's basically what the bottom part of mine consists of. Um, but anyway, so let's talk about antigens. An antigen is a pretty generalized term. It literally means an antibody generating particle. Now, that also leads us to another question. What's an antibody? Who knows? Katie. Ain't it like the cell, like the body version of the virus? So it's like, it's like, hey, I'm already in here, and I'm going to fight you all. Like, is that? No, that? You're, you're not quite on the right track. So, I don't know if y'all can see that. It looks like a Y. Antibodies are little Y-shaped proteins that are used to, uh, att they're produced by, by B cells. <laughs> They're used to attack pathogens. So like if you're exposed to the flu or get the flu, then your body is gonna, once it gets to, the, the signals get to the B cells, they're gonna produce antibodies. And those antibodies have a specific shape. They have little specific hands on each section. That's why I kind of drew these circles here. They're, they're all different, okay? So depending on what type of um, thing you're, you're fighting off. And so basically what happens is these B cells will make 2,000 of these per second. They're throwing out antibodies left and right. And as the antibodies move throughout your body, when they encounter a pathogen, when they encounter a flu virus floating through the bloodstream, they'll reach out and grab it. So their, their outside parts here match up with the outside of that pathogen. And they're able to grab a hold of it. And if you put like, you know, a 1,000... Uh, antibodies on the outside of a flu virus, then what's that flu virus not going to be able to do? It's not going to be able to infect the cell. Yeah. And so it's going to render them useless and then you're going to have some macrophage come along and find it and it's going to like Pac-Man and eat it up and then you're good to go. And so that's, that's getting far into that um, specific immune response. So you really need to know what those were first of all though. So in order to generate those antibodies, you have to have a specific shape because in your body, there are like probably millions of different um, cells that are waiting to be activated. And those cells, they can only fight a specific type of pathogen. Um, I wouldn't say there's like an unlimited number because that would be silly, but there are a lot, like probably in the millions of different types of cells that could fight different types of pathogens. So, hold on, Katie. So let's go back to the antigen part. An antigen is anything that generates an antibody, okay? So if you're a virus, so we're talking a lot about viruses in the news right now, Ashlyn. Um, what are viruses made of? Y'all didn't know this. So viruses are made on the inside, they're made of DNA or RNA. And on the outside, they're made of a protein coat called a capsid. That's all they're made of. And viruses are trying to do what? What's their objective in life? Reproduce. To reproduce. They're trying to find a cell to infect and reproduce. So how do they get into cells? They're very small. I mean, they're about the size of some proteins. Probably, some, I mean, some proteins may be as big as them. Cytokines. Through splitting? No, no. I meant, uh, like, phagocytosis when it, like, engulfs it. Okay, so it's got, the cell's got to take it in, right? Okay, so if you're a virus, you want the cell to take you in. What does the cell not want to do? Take in harmful viruses. Good, good answers. So, if you're a virus and you've got this protein coat on the outside, what would you? What are you trying to do? How do you think you're trying to get into a cell? Do cells take in proteins to use for stuff? Cells are taking in proteins all the time to use for stuff, right? You got to make more enzymes and things. Um, make other proteins. 
So they're taking in proteins all the time. So how does a virus get them, get them to take them in? Ooh, look at Mason. Yeah, it's trying to disguise itself. It's trying to disguise itself. Just be like, hey, I'm a protein. You need me. Let me bring me on in. Let's go to the party. And what does that sound a lot of like? Once it gets in there, spills its, in, spills its DNA or RNA out, incorporates it into the host cell, makes a bunch of thousands of copies. The cell spills open, splits open, and Viruses go all over your body to infect other cells. What does that sound like that virus is a lot of like? Parasite. If you were Brad Pitt 2,000 years ago, inside of a wooden structure, fighting for Helen, Trojan horse, good. God bless America. So, a Trojan horse is like something that's disguised to get something else to take it in, and then once it gets in there, it's like, boom, got you. Are y'all familiar with the story? I know what you're referring to, but I didn't know what you wanted to say right there. Y'all need to watch more TV. So, yes. So, viruses are trying to be like little Trojan horses. They're trying to get in and incorporate into your cells and um, take over. What did you say they move on the outside? Uh, just a protein coat. So like COVID, for instance, is a type of coronavirus, which means it just has little spikes that looks like a crown on the outside. And it's like, hey, just take me, you know, let's have a party. You can use me, whatever. Um, but, you know, eventually, hopefully our cells will start to recognize that. That's where the immune response comes into play. Now, I've got some a news article that shows you that vaccine that they've come out with that's supposed to be 90% effective for COVID. And it actually has the um, kind of three or four steps broken down into like how the vaccine actually works. So once we get through part two, um, once we get over to it in a second, and then um, it may be tomorrow, but we're gonna work through that article. And if you're not here tomorrow, boys, then um, I posted that on the day 20. So you can go through and look at that and kind of break down what's happening immune-wise um, with that vaccine, okay? So anyway, part one, you've got these little hands that, so when that cell's taking it in and maybe it's already infected and it's gonna die, it's gonna take a piece of that virus and it's gonna hold it out there and it's like, hey, I'm dying or I'm, this virus has got me, come kill me. And also while you're at it, here's what it looks like. Go find somebody that can fight this because it's gonna take us over. Okay, so those little hands that it holds it up with are called what? MHC. MHC. Class one. Once. Class two. Tell us about those, Sarah. All white blood cells possess these. They show other white blood cells what to look for and kill. They are like trophy hands. Come see what I have killed so that you too may seek and kill it. Yeah, so all the white blood cells, they're sharing this info with their MHC2s, and they're also getting um, the, using their special hands to get the antigens from infected cells. So if you look on 954 part A, read that for us, Mason. We've got a, we've got a host cell that's, that's infected with a virus, and then it's trying to transmit some data to the T cells. Go. Antigen Recognition. By a T cell inside of the host cell, an antigen fragment from a pathogen binds to an MHC molecule and is brought up to the cell surface where it is displayed. The combination of MHC molecule and antigen fragment is recognized by a T cell. Okay, so this host cell got infected. It brought a piece of this antigen and outside of the virus, it brought it up to the surface. And so it's holding it up for a T cell to grab a hold of. It's also, remember, it's sending chemical signals out to get that T, T cell over to it. And that T cell, with well, it's MHC2, it's like, okay, this is what we're looking for. Let me go find some of my homies and we can fight this off, okay? So that's what's going on. That's how they're communicating what to fight off. Any questions? Um, skip over to 957. Now, at the bottom of your notes, the note writer wanted to bring up um, some ways that plants are similar to 
animals, specifically, most specifically talking about um, vertebrates here. So ants, or excuse me, ants, plants have non-specific responses too that help protect them from invaders. Plants get infected by viruses and fungi and bacteria, just like we can. So what do they do? Well, and they also can protect against herbivory, which means getting eaten, which is another issue. But anyway, plants have thorns, which protect against getting eaten. They have cork cells, which means those dead cells on the outside like bark that prevents them from getting eaten. They have distasteful substances and poisons. Um, tannins are common in um, acorns and a lot of other fruit, especially when they're not ripe. And they will make you sick and not feel good. And if you eat too many, you can die depending on what type of, or how much it is. Um, some plants attract predators to help protect them. Um, there's one kind of plant, I think it's the acacia tree, that like dribbles out some sap for ants to eat, and then ants eat plants that are, or other insects that try to eat their uh, leaves, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then there are other defense substances similar to um, the shiasmonic acid. Injury releases... Causes release to other plant cell, increases cell defenses, works similar to interferon. Remember how interferon was communicating with other cells around it, like, hey, I'm infected. Get out your stuff, get ready to fight. So plants have a system similar to that. So he's kind of making an analogy of how plants and animals are similar in their um, functionality. They're analogous. All right, part two. Antigens and the immune system. So. As we're going through the immune system, just like with the nervous system, you need to think, how is this analogous to this, the signal transduction pathway? Where you have reception of a signal, transduction of a signal, and then response to that. And you're gonna see that, especially in the specific immune response. Um, glycoproteins, glycolipids on the ECM, what are they doing? Those sugars are acting like what, Tay? Identification markers on the outside of a cell. You have to have ID to get into the club, right? If not, we got problems. So for instance, if you get a heart transplant from somebody and their MHCs, their hands that they communicate with don't match up, then that cell is gonna be like, hey, this isn't supposed to be here. We're gonna attack and we're gonna kill it. And then they kill your new heart and then you die. So. Um, that's why it's super important when you get a transplant that they match up um, those um, as MHCs as closely as they can so that when cells are communicating to fight that they're, um, they're, they're like, hey, I know what you are um, and that you're similar and um, I'm not going to attack and kill you. All right. Part A, antigen. Five, read that for us. Now, I'm gonna preface this right here. That's normally the case in the immune system. Usually an antigen is a surface protein, something on the outside of a foreign foreign entity. Um, I'm, I say foreign entity because let's say you get a blood transfusion and the blood that you got does not match your blood type. Your body, we're gonna go through and do blood typing later, but just to give you the simple version. If that blood type does not match up and your body sees it as foreign, it's gonna start making what? Antibodies to kill that blood. And then you're gonna die. This happened back in the 20s and 30s-ish, somewhere in there, when they started doing blood transfusions and they noticed about two thirds of the people that got them died and it was almost, it was very consistent. And then somebody finally figured out, Maybe something, maybe people have different types of blood here. Maybe we need to sort this out before we kill some more people. So anyway, it doesn't necessarily have to be something bad like a pathogen to make an antibody. It can just be something foreign, okay? Why does that kill you? Um, so you remember the whole antibodies? They're like Y-shaped and they grab a hold of the stuff. Well, they'll grab a hold of your blood and they cause it to like clump together. It's called agglutination. Basically, they kind of all glue and clump up together, and then they can't flow through your capillaries and veins and stuff. And that's actually how they blood type, uh, Mason. They'll put like a drop of your blood, and then they have like uh, clotting factors from the other blood types that they mix in with it, and they can, you can see them like clot up. So that's how they determine what your blood type is based on how it reacts with the other types. 
We used to do that lab in anatomy. Um, let's see here. Back in the day, old school, they used to do that with real students' blood, but fortunately, they didn't let us ever do that. Anyway, antigen receptors. Um, these are recognition hands on lymphocytes. So they would be what type of MHCs? If they're recognition hands on the lymphocytes? Class no, two. two. Lymphocytes are going to be like your B and T cells. These are going to be your immune cells. Yeah. So in the they're cells in the lymphatic system that are specific for that. Um, when a pathogen is identified, that triggers clonal selection in that lymphocyte. So if you look up at the top of 957, this talks about clonal selection. Clone means what? Makes a bunch of copies. Selections mean you have to find a specific one. So for instance, Nathan, if you had exposed to like a flu virus, like you were drinking after your girlfriend and she's in the early stages of the flu and she was shedding viruses, but you didn't know it yet and you drank after her and you got some of those um, and your cells started to get infected, your, some of these, some of these uh, lymphocytes, they would be grabbing a hold of those that pathogen, that outside of that flu virus that the infected cells were holding up, and they would go out throughout your body looking for a specialized B and T cell that matched up with that pathogen, that had the same like hands or shape that would match up with it. But because we need to be so ready to fight so many different types of diseases, our body makes like a lot of them, like millions. I'm gonna say millions, that's a lot the, of different ones, but there's only maybe a few of them, like in, of each one throughout your body. So it has to go find that like specialized B and T cell. Once it finds it, then it has to make a ton of copies. And once it makes copies, then it can fight off that infection. So it takes a little while. And so if you notice the graph on the bottom of 957, you're gonna see this on the test. Um, Clonal selection makes effector cells or fighter cells, okay? So first thing you need to do, make fighter cells to kill whatever's infecting you. Then it's gonna make memory cells for future fights. Why do you want lots of memory cells? Yeah, so if, you, if you've got something once, you're pretty likely to be exposed to it again. So your body makes a bunch of memory cells so that it triggers that. And our knowledge of that is, we use that to make what? Vaccines. Vaccine. So it's the same thing. Um, and we'll go through vac vaccination in the process here in a second. Primary immune response. Read that for us, Walker. Um, uh, this refers to the first encounter with the pathogen. It generally takes 10 to 17 days to find right D DNA sequence to make antibodies for fighting. Yeah, so this takes a while to find those cells, to mount the response, and to help your body heal. Um, if you notice here on 957, you see that initial response takes a while to produce those antibodies. Now, in the second exposure, Matthew, read that for us. Second, third, whatever. Second, this is the second, third, etc. cetera, encounter the same pathogen. It takes only two to seven days to get better because of memory cells. So... The second go around, your body already has these memory cells in place. It doesn't take as long for your body to go out and find these B and T cells and make a bunch of copies. So it can find these memory cells, they can start making antibodies right away, and in doing so, you probably never knew that you had a secondary infection. Like, if you've got the cold once, you pass it around your family, you get better, you come encounter in contact with it again, your body's already gonna be able to fight it off really quick before your, a lot of cells get infected. Same thing with the flu or whatever else. And this same thing applies to, concept applies to um, vaccinations. So for instance, the COVID vaccination, I think you've actually got to have two rounds of it, but let's say we're talking about like a flu vaccine. You would get that, and then once you got that, your body's gonna be, it, you get a weakened or deadened form of the virus. Basically, they're trying to get some of the outside part of that virus in your body so that your cell recognizes it. And so you amount, amount an immune response. Now, some people swear up and down they get sick with a vaccine. You ever heard this? Mm -hmm. You may get some symptoms um, because it's not because those cell, those whatever's in the vaccine is infecting your body. 
it's just your body responds to it. The way you feel when you get sick, all the bad stuff, is just your body responding to it. The aches and the pains, that's all your body's response. So if you kind of have an overactive response, you may feel kind of tired or sleepy because your body's mounting a response and your body legitimately thinks that something's infecting it, trying to hurt it. So most of the time you don't notice it, but sometimes if you do, that's what's happening. And then the reality is if you're exposed to that flu virus later on, you've already got the memory cells in place, you're probably never gonna know it because it's gonna happen so quickly, okay? Um, how are we doing on time? We're good. All right, so that's what clonal selection is. If you look at the top of 957, um, well, let's just go through and talk about these a little bit before we go back to that. I want, I want y'all to have a little bit better knowledge of what B and T cells are first. All right, specific immune responses using lymphocytes to fight infection. Lymphocytes are your B and T cells. These are your main specific fighters in um, an immune response. So whatever has come in your body, whatever pathogen, Matthew, has already got in, it's got past all the other defenses, it's got in the cell, it's already tricked that cell, and it's triggered replication. And that cell, cells have already started dying and they started releasing probably, I think the flu, I wanna say one time I read, maybe it was like 5,000 viruses per cell. It's a lot of viruses are getting spread from each cell that comes out. You people on the internet can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, this immunity, like specific, this immunity is the attack of specific pathogens using lymphocyte white blood cells. Um, these are your specialized assassins. So they are only able to go and kill one thing. They are trained and they are made to kill one type of specific pathogen. Okay. Number one, Miranda. Yes, so B cells make antibodies. They make them at a rate of about, if you look on down there and you're halfway in your notes, 2,000 per second. So once, they, once you find the correct B cell and it starts cloning itself and making antibodies, it, it's gonna make a lot really quickly. Um, I don't know how many that is in a day, but that's a lot, okay? Um, T cells, Katie. Lymphocytes. T or thymus lymphocytes. These kill by using chemicals to kill infected cells. Okay, so you'll see this T or thymus because that's where they mature the thymus gland in your body. Um, there's actually, I don't really... Let's look at these as two very different cells, okay? So the main one, I want to skip on down and look at helper T cells, Mariah. Read that for us. Yeah, and the reality is the helper T cells are kind of the, um, they're pretty much the control unit for your specific Im immune response. So them being infected and rendered useless by um, the HIV virus, then that's a problem because that affects your all of your specific immune response, really. So that's an issue. Um, and then the cytotoxic T cells, these are the ones that are actually kill infected cells. They have like chemical weapons basically that they use to kill cells. So since we're kind of low on time, let's skip over to page 962 real quick. And I'm gonna let you work on your concept map a little bit and you can kind of think and talk about that when we're all about out of time. On 962, when you get to specific immune response where you get pathogen exposure, so like, a, let's say a cell gets infected, it's MHC1s, it's holding up the outside of that, that virus or whatever it is, and then it, it, it presents it to an antigen-presenting cell, that antigen-presenting, so it could be another white blood cell, like it could be like a macrophage or something. That's gonna then take it and show it to the helper T cell. Now you'll notice kind of the helper T cell is coordinating or helping kind of facilitate this whole response. Once these helper T cells get alerted, they're gonna turn on toxic cytotoxic T cells, which go around basically shooting up infected cells and killing them. 
And it's also gonna turn on B cells, which are gonna start throwing out antibodies. They're almost like little boomerangs that they're throwing out and that are glomming on to the pathogens. And so the helper T cell, I think you could say it's the most important there, the bunch, because it's helping to facilitate the turning on of the other two. And the other two just go out and like, they start all the killing, okay? So work on that, think about that, and we'll finish part two tomorrow and hopefully work through most of part three. You people at home, stay safe.